Hey y'all, Dixie here. Tis the season for people to start gathering or probably even finalizing their through hiking gear for the Appalachian Trail, even though I didn't actually get my first piece of gear until February and I started in March. But anyway, when I finished my through hike of the AT, I made a video reviewing all of my gear to let people know how it worked out for me. That video still gets views to this day and since it's been over six years since I've made that video, I felt like I should revisit it and see if I could still recommend that gear, even after all of the experience I've had in backpacking since then. I haven't watched my AT gear review video in several years until this morning. My apologies y'all because that video is rough. But that's just a good example of not having analysis paralysis and if you want to do something like start a YouTube channel, you just do it and then you can refine things as you go along. But anyway, back to the gear. I would say when I was preparing for my through hike of the Appalachian Trail that I was somewhere within a mid-range budget. I didn't just have all the money to spend on all of my fantasy gear, but I didn't have to go to the strict under a $500 budget. So any gear that I mentioned today that I would no longer use and I offer a replacement suggestion, it's gonna be within that same general price range of the product that I used before. I'll include a lighter pack link to all of this gear in the video description of this video. And also I'm gonna include another link that's if I could have my dream gear to hike the AT, what that would be too. That way, if you're not limited to the budget that I was when I was preparing for the AT, you could see what I would love to use if I were to rehack it. First things first, starting off with the big three, the shelter that I started with on the AT was a hammock setup, which ended up being a complete disaster. I did a whole video on why I switched from a hammock to a tent, but the tent that I used for the rest of the way, so pretty much the whole AT except for 30 to 40 miles, was the Big Agnes Fly Creek UL2. This was a quality two-walled tent that, as the name indicates, was a two-person tent. It weighed two pounds, five ounces, which is not bad for a semi-freestanding double-walled tent. The only real gripe I had with this tent is that the opening was on one of the smaller ends of the tent. So you kind of had to crawl in like it was a dog crate and then turn around. So it's just a little awkward. So while I think the Big Agnes Fly Creek 2 is definitely a suitable option for through hiking the Appalachian Trail, if I had to do it all again in the same price point, I would opt for Gossamer Gears The 2. It's a two person tent that does set up using trekking poles. So this is a little bit different, it takes a tiny bit more skill than a semi freestanding tent. But if you practice a few times before you hit the trail, unlike I did where I just kind of threw myself to the wolves and I think you'll be fine. The two costs $375, so just $25 more than the Fly Creek UL2 and it weighs 23.5 ounces, so it's definitely a good bit lighter. For either one of these tents, you have to have a ground cloth. I didn't waste the money on the Fly Creek UL2 footprint that was made for the tent. Instead, I just used a piece of Tyvek, which worked fine and I think was actually a little bit more lightweight than the footprint itself would have been. Same thing with the two, they actually don't make a footprint for this, but they do sell a sheet of polycryo, which costs 11 extra dollars and it only weighs 3.65 ounces. So actually if I was to use the Fly Creek UL2 again, or any tent that required a ground cloth, I would just opt for using a sheet of the polycryo cut down to fit under the footprint of whatever tent I was using because it's gonna be the most lightweight option and it definitely would have been lighter than the Tyvek. Next for my pack on the Appalachian Trail, I use the Osprey Aura Anti-Gravity 50 liter pack. I still like this pack and I think it's a great beginner pack. If you're somebody who wants to go to a store like REI, see the product in person, test it out and know that you have that year period to return it if it doesn't work out for you, I completely understand. This pack nowadays costs $240, but it weighs four pounds and three ounces for the medium size that I used on my AT through hack. I do think that the 50 liter capacity worked just fine for me. You could go up to maybe a 65 liter, but I think anything past that is just 
giving yourself too much room to cram too much gear into. It is nice to be able to go to the store, take all of your gear, make sure it fits in the pack that you're buying. But I assure you that if you get a pack in the 50 to 65 liter range, that you'll find a way to put all of your gear in there and limiting yourself might actually be a good thing. Nowadays, I would go with the ULA Ohm 2.0. It's the pack that I really like and prefer at this time. I've had some more expensive, more lightweight packs, but this one is kind of midway for me to where it's not too ultra light, that it doesn't carry comfortably because now my pack weight is actually more than it used to be because I carry so much camera equipment. The Ohm 2.0 has a 63 liter capacity. Now that's not all on the inside in the body of the pack. That's including all of the external pockets, cup holders, etc. It costs $260, so it's a little bit more expensive, but it only weighs 33.1 ounces, so it's just over over two pounds. ULA does say that the maximum weight they recommend having in this pack is 30 pounds. I've certainly had more than that and it still carries pretty comfortably, but I think the most weight I ever had in my pack on the Appalachian Trail was 38 pounds and that was the first day that I started and it included the trekking poles that were attached to my pack, two liters of water, which was super excessive for what I needed to carry on the AT and five or six days of food, which was way too much for the first stretch. So most of the time I was probably carrying between the upper 20s and lower 30s. And that was including the four pound pack. But obviously this is going to be dependent on your gear. So if you know that your gear is really heavy, it might do you better to go with a more sturdy, pack that's built to carry more weight. For my pack liner on the Appalachian Trail, I used just a compactor bag slash contractor bag. They're both pretty similar. It worked fine and if that's what you have at the house and you want to use it, then you'll be good to go. But I prefer now to use Gossamer Gears pack liners made specifically for lining a pack because they're more lightweight than those contractor or compactor bags and they just fit better in the pack. With the compactor bags or contractor bags, you've got to buy a whole box of them anyway, again, unless you already have them at the house. But for Gossamer Gears pack liners, they only cost $5 for a pack of two. So you could take one with you and then have one at home and have your support person send it to you or go ahead and send it to yourself about halfway along the trail. And you could always order more from Gossamer Gear if you needed them, but one pack liner usually lasts me a pretty decent while. My sleeping bag on the AT was a Sierra Designs Zisu 23 degree 700 fill power dried down sleeping bag. I've seen online where some things say it was rated for 23 degrees comfort and some places where it says it was rated for 23 degrees survival. And that is a big deal when you're picking out a sleeping bag to know whether it's comfort or survival because just because you'll be alive down to 23 degrees doesn't mean that you're not gonna be miserable. This bag costs somewhere around $200 if I remember correctly, and it weighed about two pounds. Unfortunately, in my AT gear review video, I said that this bag worked just fine for me. And yeah, I was a little bit cold in the Smokies and also at the end in Maine when I was kind of a late finisher and the snow started coming down I've had some colder nights. But after upgrading and using other down sleeping bags and now quilts, I have to say I 100% would not recommend the sleeping bag. I didn't have anything to compare it to and I did actually say that in the video, but thanks to my patrons when I started the Pacific Crest Trail, I was able to upgrade a lot of my gear and I've not looked back on that sleeping bag since, and thankfully it's not available online anymore. I didn't realize how warm I could actually be at night. I think that I just somewhere along the way accepted that you're cold when you go backpacking and you sleep at night. But as long as I was alive, then I was happy. I think sometimes ignorance is bliss, but my favorite down quilt ever is the Catabatic 
gear Alsec 22. Unfortunately, it costs about twice as much as the Sierra Designs bag did. And now that I'm allergic to down, I probably can't use it anymore anyway. So for my new recommendation, if you're looking for a sleeping bag slash quilt, in the less than two pounds range that's also around two hundred dollars then i'm going to recommend my enlightened equipment enigma apex quilt it's a 20 degree quilt for the dimensions i needed it came out to 26.8 ounces and cost 230 dollars so it's a similar price point and also lighter than the sleeping bag i used on the at now it is a quilt so it might take a bit more getting used to for a beginner if i could transition to a quilt then i promise you can too this is actually a synthetic quilt not a down quilt it would work fine for the appalachian trail i had a lot of condensation on the east coast things are always damp and kind of gross and moldy smelling so synthetic would actually probably work well and give you more peace of mind in case things get damp because a synthetic bag will still have insulating properties where a down bag kind of just melts. If I had it my way I would still prefer down but for a similar price and under two pounds this is really the best recommendation I can give as far as something that I've actually used. For the temperatures that you will experience if you start a through hike of the AT in March and finish in mid-October. When you're doing research for the AT, you may read where people send home their colder sleeping bag and get somebody to send their warm weather bag to them. I couldn't afford two different sleeping bags. I could barely afford one. So if you're like me on that, in the warmer months, I ended up using a fleece sleeping bag liner it was more lightweight than my sleeping bag and it took up less space, but it was warm enough for the months where I was mostly sweating in my tent. So anyway, that's a cheaper alternative that I would probably still stick with. The sleeping pad I started with on the AT was a closed cell phone pad that I got from an outdoor store for about $10. They are bulletproof and it's nice because you can trim them to the length that you need to save a little bit of weight if you don't use the whole thing. You can use them for breaks during the day, etc. But by New Jersey, I was miserable and could not sleep. And if I had to sell a kidney on the black market, I was gonna find a way to buy an inflatable sleeping pad. So when I went to shell out the money for an inflatable sleeping pad, I decided to just get the top of the line one because I was tired of not sleeping. I think in some areas, if you can skimp, sure, do that. But if you're somebody who sleeps on anything but your back, then I would recommend going on and investing in a good sleeping pad. Again, you can get it from REI so you feel a little bit more comfortable with your purchase being backed by a company that even if you use it, you have up to a year to return it if it doesn't work out for you. I ended up transitioning to the Thermarest NeoAir X-Lite and I have stuck with that same style sleeping pad since then. I've gone from a regular length down to a shorter length that just goes from my head to my knees and then I put my pack up under my legs because I wanted to save a little bit more weight, but they weigh anywhere from eight ounces for the short one up to 16 ounces for the longer one, and it is definitely worth it. The price is also different depending on which one you get, and that ranges from right now $150 to $230. Now let's talk about the kitchen, everything food and water. The food bag I currently use is the z packs bear bagging kit it costs 50 bucks it comes with a dyneema dry sack and cord but that's not necessary for the at i used a dry sack that i got from academy sports and outdoors for probably 10 to 15 dollars as long as you have about a 20 liter dry sack not like a dry bag that's submersible that you would use when kayaking you don't need something that heavy weight but just a thin dry sack that you can throw all your food in and hang it up in a tree. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And if I was at the same budget point, I would get the same dry bag again. For less than $10, I got a grease pot from Kmart. You can get them online on Amazon and I made my own pot cozy. The pot weighs 3.65 ounces, so it was 
possibly even more lightweight than your typical titanium pot and it was a lot cheaper and honestly I'm still using that exact same grease pot. On the AT I had a titanium spork and I finally realized that I wasn't a sporker I was a spooner because those little prines on the spork weren't really useful anyway and I transitioned to a Tokes long handle spoon. I still stand by you should just invest in a titanium spoon. You can get one for anywhere from seven to $15. If you get a plastic one, you're gonna end up breaking it several times. And by the time you purchase several of them, then you could just have a titanium spoon. Mine weighs 0.55 ounces, but if you wanted to, you could even just take a spoon from your drawer at home but I do recommend having a metal spoon. My stove on the AT was an MSR Pocket Rocket. It was a little bit bulkier and heavier than they are nowadays. They cost about the same though, $45, and they now weigh 2.6 ounces. It's a good stove and it's definitely more stable of a surface to cook on and probably more efficient than what I use now, which is the BRS titanium stove. It's just under an ounce and usually costs about $15 online. So if you wanna save a little bit of money, you could go with the BRS, but I certainly think that the Pocket Rocket 2 is a great stove. I am still using my old trusty Sea to Summit collapsible cup. This is definitely a luxury item and not a necessity. I have had to replace it, I think twice, since six and a half years ago, but I like it because I enjoy drinking my coffee while I'm eating my breakfast. And I also appreciate the little lines on the inside of the cup for measurement. So when you're cooking, you know exactly how much water you're measuring out. The Sea to Summit cups cost about $14 and weigh 1.4 ounces. And finally, I always carry a bandana in my food pot to use as like a hot pad or to dry it out after I wash it or if I need a bandana for any other purpose. Now, let's talk about water. I'm just gonna say heck no to the system that I used before. I apologize if I steered anybody wrong on this. When I started the AT, I was on the right track. I used the Sawyer Squeeze, but I got tired of the bags busting on me. I got tired of squeezing water. So when I found the Platypus gravity system, I thought I had found the best thing since sliced bread because you could just collect your dirty water in one bladder and let gravity do the work for you, go through the filter and voila, you had clean water in the clean bladder. But this system costs over $100 and weighs around eight ounces. And then on top of that, to drink my water, I would put it in a platypus bladder and drink through a hydration tube. Thankfully, during my through hike of the Pacific Crest Trail, I ended up doing a pack shakedown with a hiker that was more experienced than I was. And he said, why don't you just use a Sawyer Squeeze with smart water bottles? And I was like, oh, mind blown because then all you have to do is collect your dirty water in a smart water bottle or any other bottle with a similar thread, screw on the Sawyer Squeeze and you can drink right through it. If you're cooking, you can squeeze water from that water bottle into your pot. If you wanna mix in a drink packet, then you just have a designated clean bottle and you squeeze water from your dirty bottle through the Sawyer Squeeze into your clean bottle and put in your drink mix. This is a much better system in my opinion because not only is it more lightweight and less expensive, but you can also see how much water you have when you're carrying these smart water bottles in the side pockets of your pack. Also, it's so much easier to collect water on the go. Before I would have to take off my pack, take out the gravity system, take out the bladder and all that. Now I can leave my pack on and just scoop up water screw back on my Sawyer Squeeze and keep trucking. The regular Sawyer Squeeze costs $40 and it weighs three ounces, plus you'll have the weight of, if you use smart water bottles, and they're about 1.4, 1.5 ounces a piece. So definitely save your money and save this weight to use on something else. For my clothing bag on the AT, I used a stuff sack that came with my pack. You can just use any stuff sack like I mentioned before from Academy or whatever you can find online or at your local outfitter that's just a dry bag that will fit all of your clothing. 
I nowadays use Dyneema Stuff Sacks from z -Packs because it shaves a little bit of weight to offset all of my camera equipment, but that's more expensive and not necessary. For hiking on the AT, I wore a tank top. This was honestly the best option in the way of keeping cool. You're under the green tunnel, so you're not in direct sunlight beating down on you, and it's so muggy and damp that it was comfortable wearing a tank top. Nowadays, if I could go back, I would hope that I would be a little wiser and make better decisions as far as protecting myself from the sun. I wasn't getting sunburnt frequently because one, I had the base tan, and two, once the leaves grew in, again, I didn't have that constant direct sunlight. But all in all, whether I would opt now to wear a long sleeve shirt that I could kind of unbutton or that was ventilated well, like I've used since on the PCT, CDT, etc. I would hope that I would do that, but at a bare minimum, I wish I could have told myself to wear sunscreen every day. And I know some people are going to say, well, sunscreen causes cancer, so that's bad too. But you can get the mineral sunscreen that's more of a physical block from the sun than a chemical. I can't imagine hiking the AT in leggings or pants, if I'm being honest, even though I just mentioned sun protection. I normally hike in Patagonia Barely Baggies shorts. They worked really well for me on the AT, and I've continued to use, if not the same exact pair than another pair, I think I've only had two pair total of these Barely Baggy shorts. That's how well they work. I'm not big on using a name brand just because it's a name brand, but if it's a quality piece of clothing that I'm not having to replace all the time, then I appreciate it. And the Patagonia Barely Baggies do hold up even if you're doing some rock sliding on your butt. For sleeping on the AT in the warmer months, I had just a cotton tank top and cotton shorts that I'd gotten from Walmart. I would use those again in a heartbeat. They worked just fine, allowed me to air things out at night because again, it's so humid out there. And I know people say cotton kills, but it's really more of an issue in the winter when if you're hiking and you're sweating, the cotton can trap the moisture. And then when you stop, you'll cool down quickly and possibly too quickly. For sleeping when it was cold on the AT, I used a pair of fleece lined leggings and a long sleeve top that also had kind of a fuzzy feel to the inside of it and thumb holes. I really loved that it had thumb holes because it just helped keep my hands warm when it was colder outside. I would use these same leggings and top again. Any synthetic pair of leggings and top will work. Those leggings that I used on the AT were 10 bucks from like Rue 21 and I still use them to this day. One thing that I feel like I really left out on my AT gear and I learned the hard way on the PCT was having a base layer to hack in if it's cold and rainy. I'm very adamant that I want to keep my sleeping clothes dry when it's cold outside. So if it's just cool and I'm not sweating, then sure I can use them to hack in. But if it's raining and cold, I used to just keep on my shorts and whatever shirt I had on and then I would put on my raincoat and pants. But on the PCT, I experienced cold temperatures like I had never experienced before. It's like a different bone chilling cold than I felt on the AT. I did get a little too cold on the AT sometimes, but to save weight, I just suffered. Uh, you don't have to suffer. You can add a little bit more weight to make sure that you are safe. So I definitely want to recommend that if you're going to be in cold temperatures and in rainy weather, that under your rain gear, you have an extra base layer to hack in. This can be a thin synthetic pair of leggings and a thin synthetic shirt, but you do want that added warmth. And if you're really cold temperatures and it's snowing a lot, like I experienced on the Continental Divide Trail, I even added in a pullover fleece to hack in because just the base layer wasn't keeping me warm enough and I didn't want to hack in my puffy coat and get that wet and not have it to wear at night. Something else I feel like I missed the mark on for gear on the AT is gloves. I think at the beginning I would have been much more comfortable if I had something to keep my hands warm while I was hiking and certainly at the end. And I did mention in my video that I acquired a pair of cheap gloves probably from Walmart or something. 
for hiking in Maine when it was cold, but they were pretty much worthless. The best gloves that I've found that are lightweight, that help keep my hands warm, are possum down gloves. You can get them on Amazon or on z -Pack's website. They cost $25 and they weigh 1.3 ounces. Now they are not waterproof, so if you already have a good pair of gloves that you like, you can use those. But I pair these with something else to make them waterproof and I'll talk about that when I get to rain gear. For my puffy coat, I had a synthetic jacket from REI. It was on sale, it was less than $100. It was probably close to 60 to $75. It worked fine and if you can find something equivalent to this, just any sort of puffy coat to help keep you warm, then that'll work. You don't have to have a $400 down jacket or else you can't go hike the AT. I will say though, I like the synthetic coat that I use now much better than the one I used on the AT. I'm currently using the Enlightened Equipment women's torrid apex jacket it's more expensive than the one that i got from rei again that one was on sale though so it would have been more expensive the torrid is 175 dollars and it weighs eight ounces but i know people who used fleece pullovers on the at so you can take whatever you have to keep yourself warm. It's more about layering though and not having just the bulkiest thing that you can find. I definitely prefer having a coat that has a hood above everything else. You can use a beanie, but you'll still get drafts on your neck and I just like being able to bundle up under a hood. Something in the clothing category that I carried with me on the AT that I would no longer carry and I ditched it while I was on the Pacific Crest Trail is a town dress. Especially on the AT, I don't feel like this is necessary. It was convenient for when I was doing laundry to be able to throw on a dress that had built-in cups for a bra and to allow my clothes to wash dry and then I could put those back on and I only wore my town dress while I was doing laundry and after I had showered. But there are so many places nowadays to stay on the AT even more than when I was out there that have loner clothes so you can wash everything and wear just t-shirts and shorts and stuff that they have. And also you can always wear your rain jacket and rain pants while you're doing laundry. So you'll find a way if you don't have town dress and make it work if you wanna save that money and weight Again, if I had to do it again, I would ditch this. As far as undergarments go, I would pretty much keep things the same, and I have kept things pretty much the same since the AT. For my sports bra, I wear the same style and brand. It's a BCG bra from Academy Sports and Outdoors. For underwear, I like the X officios that I wore back then, but any synthetic underwear and bra that's comfortable for you will work. For socks, I have experimented a little bit, but once I found darn tough socks that had the lifetime warranty on them, I've stuck with those. And now I've also added in farm to feet socks, which I feel like are a little bit more comfortable and soft, but they still have that lifetime guarantee. So either of those I'm good with. I like having one pair to sleep in at night, usually a thicker pair. And then for hiking on the wetter trails like the Appalachian Trail, the Florida Trail, having three pairs of socks to rotate through while hiking, I, I really like having that. For drier climates, maybe, I can get by with two. I mean, I could get by with one pair all the time, but that's not what I prefer. And then of course, my hiking socks are the more thin, less cushioned socks. For footwear, I made the mistake of starting out with a pair of Loa boots. I'm sure it's a great brand of boots, but my feet and boots just don't work out on trail. I stuck with Solomon Trail Runners for the rest of the AT, aside from those 30 to 40 miles that I hiked in boots. But after that, I ended up switching out to Ultras and then from there to Topo Athletic Terra Ventures. So if I was to start the AT again today, I would start out with a pair of Topo Athletic Terra Venture 3s. I like the wide toe box and also the sturdy sole. I tried out several different pairs of insoles on the AT. I did the sole brand, a couple different types of the Superfeet insoles, and I finally honed in on the Dr. Scholl's for plantar fasciitis 
because I experienced plantar fasciitis. They cost $20. You can get them sometimes at pharmacies, Walmart, and online at Amazon. They were cheaper than the Soul brand and the Super Feet brand, and they've continued to work for me. Something in the way of footwear that I would probably ditch if I was to do the AT again is camp shoes. The AT is nice to have camp shoes because your feet do stay so damp and wet. So if I was going to have camp shoes, it would be on a trail like the AT or the Florida Trail. But for the drier climates, I just don't feel like they're necessary. And again, I probably would not start with them on the AT. For rain gear, I used Frog Togs, and I still think that this is a suitable option for hiking the AT. I did have to replace my first set a little more than halfway through the trail and I got another set a different color this time I went from berry blue to khaki they aren't the most fashionable things in the world but you get the rain jacket and the rain pants for $20 so for two different sets of those it's cheaper than any lightweight rain gear that I know of one thing that I did not carry on the AT for rain gear that I definitely would going forward is an umbrella. On Amazon, you can get a lightweight, cheap umbrella for maybe $10 or so that weighs eight ounces. I really like having an umbrella to hack with. I originally got it to help protect me from the sun in the exposed areas on the Pacific Crest Trail, but once I used it for rain, I really enjoyed it because it helps keep you dry, but also warmer. Even though I had rain gear on the AT, when your rain gear is constantly getting drowned out with the rain, it's hard to maintain body heat. Whereas if you have an umbrella over your head, it kind of protects you from getting some rain on you. So your legs stay more dry and even the splashing and stuff, uh, your rain jacket helps protect you. But having that umbrella is just, I don't know, it, it's a nice escape from just being poured on and having your face get wet the whole time. What I was mentioning earlier about waterproofing your gloves, there's a brand of gloves called Showa Timorous. I guess that's how you pronounce it. I discovered these thanks to a review by Andrew Skirka, who used them on some of his backcountry expeditions. They are a waterproof working type glove and they allow you to still have dexterity, but you can slide these over the possum down gloves that I mentioned earlier because the possum down gloves are thin, but also insulating and then you slide these over it so you don't have these bulky mittens that you can't use. So you're still able to grip things and use your hands with this system. Next, I wanna talk about electronics. I used two different headlamps on the AT. One was from Target and it cost $10 and it sucked. And then I used a Coast headlamp that worked much better. Later, I upgraded to a Black Diamond headlamp and all of these cost probably 40 or so dollars, but they were kind of heavy and I had to deal with carrying backup batteries. So going forward, I switched to the Nightcore NU25 headlamp. It's $37, it weighs two ounces, and it's a rechargeable headlamp. What I mainly look for in a headlamp now, one, is that it's rechargeable. Two, that it's adjustable, so you don't have to like stare down at your feet and get a crick in your neck. You can have the light look down while you're still looking up. And three, a red beam. That way I'm not blinding hikers that I come across or when I'm hanging out in camp. The NU25 has all of these features. And so that's what I'm using now. And if I were to start the AT again, I would take that out on trail with me. For a backup battery bank, I am sold on the Anchor brand. I discovered this when I was on the AT because another hiker had an Anchor battery bank. So after the AT and after I was sick of using the little crappy ones I had, they worked fine for me on the AT, but when I started getting more camera equipment and needed more juice, I'd noticed those didn't hold a charge quite like the Anchor brand did. I think for just starting out, if you have minimal electronics, a 10,000 milliamp hour charger would probably work fine for you. I started with that then moved up to a 20 and then I was carrying the 20 and the 10 and so now I just have a 30,000 milliamp hour charger which works great for all of the stuff I have but is definitely overkill for most people. In the way of electronics I have also added to my pack an in-reach device. I currently have the mini. 
This is not a necessity. I hiked the AT without a personal locator beacon or an inReach. And I think if you're gonna go on a long distance trail, the AT is the best one to do without these devices. But I have to recommend that people at least carry a personal locator beacon. If you can afford it, maybe you can ask for it for a birthday or for some other a departing present. Uh, this will just help give you peace of mind, but also your loved ones knowing that if you needed to call for help at any time, you could push a button and do so. And finally, I suggest carrying a wall plug because when you're in town, you'll have to recharge your battery bank if you have one or other electronics, headlamp, cell phone. So if you can get a wall charger that has more than one USB port to plug your cords into. That way you don't have multiple wall chargers and take up several outlets. You can use one outlet and charge several things from it. Onto a couple of miscellaneous items. With me on the AT, I had a pocket knife and some pepper spray. When I would hitchhike, I would keep these things in my pocket for self-protection, but it was also nice, of course, having the knife to cut summer sausage or the cheese. <laughs> I ended up moving to a neck knife for the Pacific Crush Trail. I do like having it conveniently located. That way, if I've gone and sat over on a log and my pack's over there and I realize, oh my gosh, my knife is in my hip belt pocket. Now I got to get up and go dig for it. With the neck knife, it's conveniently located for easy access, whether you want to eat something or whether it's for self-defense. The neck knife that I have and carry is made by MT Knives. It's a good quality knife, the best knife that I've ever had, but it isn't the most inexpensive choice. I like the idea of a neck knife, so regardless if I went with the same brand or a more affordable brand, I would carry a neck knife on the AT. I don't typically carry pepper spray anymore unless I know I'm gonna be on a lot of road walks with dogs because as a last resort, if I'm being attacked, then I would use the pepper spray over trying to beat them to death or have to stab them. So I probably wouldn't carry it again on the AT, but if it makes you feel more comfortable having it, then you definitely should. The trekking poles I carried on the AT were just women's trekking poles. REI brand, I think they cost somewhere between $75 to $100. They worked absolutely fine on the AT and I probably would have kept using them on the Pacific Crest Trail, except I lost them somewhere along the way on Katahdin because it was so cold out that my trekking poles froze open. And when I got to the boulder areas, I was having trouble scrambling over the boulders with my trekking poles extended. So I propped them against a rock and said, I'll get you on the way down. And when I came down, I guess I went a different way. So to my knowledge, they're still up there somewhere on Katahdin. I don't think that it's necessary to spend up to $100 or even over $100 like I have since the AT on trekking poles. I've actually used the $20 pair that you can get on Amazon. I had to do a little tightening of the locks, but they worked just fine. I can't speak to how they would work for a through hack, so it may be better to invest in that $75 to $100 pair. If any of y'all can speak to how a $20 pair holds up on the AT or another through hack, I would love to hear that. The main things that I look for in a pair of trekking poles though is that they have the lever locks. I just don't like those twisty lock in place ones, too much can go wrong, and that they have cork grips. And also of course that they are collapsing in general. The only other thing that I can really think of is to get to Katahdin before it snows. And if you don't, for some reason, carry micro spikes for the love of God. Unfortunately, when I summited Katahdin, it was October 19th. Yes, four days after the tentative close date for Katahdin. Somehow they were still allowing hikers to summit. I ended up making it up there okay and back down fine, even though it was slick as all get out. There was ass everywhere. I just didn't know that micro spikes existed. Otherwise I would have had a pair. And when I started preparing for my through hike of the Pacific Crest Trail, I read that I needed an ice ax and micro spikes or possibly crampons. So I wish I had known what that was before I started my through hike of the AT. So if you're like me and you're about to start the AT and you have no idea what micro spikes are, they are these cool little web thingies with 
metal spikes that you can slide onto your trail runners or boots and they help you grip in the ice so you don't fall down and injure yourself or worse fall off the freaking mountain all right well i think that pretty much sums it up basically if i had to do the at again there are definitely some things that i would tweak but ultimately the gear that i used on the at worked out well enough for me that i was able to complete my through hack I think the bottom line is try to get the best stuff you can for the budget that you have. But I always go back to that. Grandma Gatewood did it with way less than most of us do today. And she was able to be successful not one time, not two times, but actually three times. If you have any questions about the gear that I used previously or the new recommendations that I have, please feel free to leave those questions in the comments below and myself or somebody else in the community can chime in on that because I am one person with just my own experiences and gear is definitely not a one size fits all thing. For those of you who are getting ready to start your through hacks of the AT next year, good luck to you. Be careful, it is addicting and it will most likely be simultaneously the most awesome and the most sucky thing you've ever experienced in your life. But I definitely have no regrets for getting out there and through hiking and I hope that you will feel the same. Just remember, no pain, no rain, no main. Thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe before you go and we will see y'all next time.